Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities. Supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Hello, my name's Steve Hill. I'm the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia. Welcome to the 2023 Exploring for the Future Showcase. Thanks so much for joining us today and hopefully over the next uh, couple of days where we're going to have some great presentations, discussions and panels. Firstly, I'd like to wish everybody a happy National Science Week. Let's not forget that our science is an important part of our nation and this is a great week to be able to recognise and celebrate that. While I'm in the mode of recognition and celebration, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, I'm joining you from the Geoscience Australia buildings in Simonston in Canberra, which is part of Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. And they've of course had a long association with this area and continue to. And we have a video that um, promotes that. But before we do, I'd just like to extend um, my respect to any First Nations Australians that are attending today. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. Terrific. That's a great video. I really love the way that's really engaged a lot of staff across Geoscience Australia and speaks really from a very personal place in just about everyone who works here. So that's terrific. Um, we also have a series of presentations that we're going to um, share with you today. And first up, I'd like to um, introduce the Honourable Madeline King, MP, the Minister for Resources, 
and Minister for Northern Australia. Hello everyone. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this event is taking place, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people listening today. Thank you to Geoscience Australia for the opportunity to speak ahead of the Exploring for the Future Showcase Plenary Session. In particular, I'd like to thank and acknowledge today's MC, Geoscience Australia's Chief Scientist, Dr Steve Hill, as well as the plenary speakers from Geoscience Australia, Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division, Dr Andrew Heap, and Exploring for the Future Program Senior Science Advisor, Dr Carol Zanotta. I'm sure everyone is looking forward to your respective presentations on what is a fascinating topic. The importance of Australia's mineral and energy resources cannot be overstated. They are the engine room of our economy and a steady stream of new resources projects is essential to our continued prosperity. But these projects do not happen overnight. On average, it takes 16 years from initial exploration and discovery to development and production. And every project starts by knowing where to look. That is why programs like Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future are so important. The theme of this year's showcase is the role of pre-competitive geoscience in supporting Australia's transition to net zero. This is apt given the work is only going to become more important for Australia as we strive to be a key player in the world's transition to clean energy. We want to be a renewable energy superpower. And I've long said that the road to net zero runs through Australia's resources sector. Unlocking the full potential of our critical minerals and energy transition metals will help us achieve our net zero ambitions. We know global demand for these commodities is rapidly increasing. Decarbonisation and the growth in electronic, communication and military technologies is driving this demand at a striking pace. Meanwhile, traditional commodities, including our energy resources, will also play an essential role in supporting our transition to net zero. These resources will also continue to underwrite energy security for our key trading partners. So too will emissions reduction technologies like carbon capture and storage, green steel production and low emission energy sources like hydrogen. In fact, new insights into the potential storage of hydrogen in salt caverns are released at this event last year, immediately stimulated the uptake of new exploration tenements in South Australia and Queensland. At these sites, companies are now undertaking detailed investigations to assess the feasibility of low cost hydrogen storage to accelerate the development of this growing sector. Today, I'm pleased to announce the release of a new report by Deloitte Access Economics on the economic value of pre-competitive geoscience data for Australia's resources industry. The report reveals the work of GA and Australian State and Territory Geological Surveys supported a direct contribution to the Australian economy of $76 billion by the resource exploration and extraction sectors and over 80,000 full-time jobs in the 2021-22 financial year. And these estimates are considered conservative. The return on that investment is fantastic given Australia's share of global exploration expenditure has grown from 8% to 18% since the program began. Importantly, the Deloitte report also highlights the role this data will play in supporting the discovery of minerals that will support the development of clean energy technologies. I'm excited to hear what impacts and benefits might come from the program's latest insights and releases. Again, I would like to thank Geoscience Australia for the invitation to be part of today's program. Please enjoy the rest of this afternoon's program and I look forward to catching up with many of you soon. Thank you so very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Minister King. It was great to have you part of the program today and really once again to, to see your enthusiasm, passion and support for the work that we do here at Geoscience Australia. Our next speaker is Dr Andrew Heap and um, he's going to um, once again share with us some information and then we'll have some question and answer session at the end of that. And um, Dr Andrew Heap is the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia. He has 20 
two years of professional experience in geoscience research as a senior leader in Geoscience Australia. Dr Heap graduated with first class honours in geography from the University of Auckland, which has in brackets after it New Zealand, so that's good and reassuring, um, in 1996 and completed his PhD in Earth Sciences at James Cook University, which is in Townsville, uh, in the year 2000. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thanks for that kind introduction, Steve. Hello, everyone. As Steve said, I'm Andrew Heap, and, and as the Chief of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia, it's my great pleasure to officially open the Exploring for the Future showcase for 2023. Over the next two days, you'll hear from our experts and leaders on a range of new tools, new data, and the application of these to improving our understanding of Australia's mineral, energy, and groundwater resource potential as part of the Exploring for the Future program. But before talking about the importance of the Exploring for the Future program for supporting our future mineral, energy, and groundwater needs, I'd like to provide background on Geoscience Australia and pre-competitive geoscience. For those of you not familiar with Geoscience Australia, our purpose is to be the trusted advisor on earth sciences to inform government, community, and industry decision-making. Pre-competitive geoscience is needed now more than ever for Australia to transition to net zero while building Australia's resources wealth and securing our nation's water resources. The work we undertake on behalf of the Australian Government is referred to as pre-competitive geoscience because it is at the earliest stage of information. It comes before private sector investment, not instead of it. Our work establishes fundamental information about the geography and geology of Australia, used to support sustainable management and harnessing of Australia's full resource potential. It is the first link in the supply chain, a prospectus if you like, driving investment in resource exploration, improving groundwater management and creating jobs and growth opportunities, especially in regional Australia. In my talk today, I'll focus on the value of pre-competitive geoscience to Australia for the net zero future. In Australia, we see the impact of climate change through intensifying droughts and flooding rains. These climatic events put millions of households at risk each year and place pressure on food prices and affect the air we breathe. The Australian Government is committed to reducing Australia's net greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050 through the Climate Change Act 2022. More broadly, the global shift to clean energy is the biggest peacetime economic transformation we've ever seen. Australia's geography, geology and world-class resources sector put Australia in a prime position to realise our net zero goals and simultaneously become a clean energy superpower. There is consensus that the net zero transition will be resource intensive. Here is one set of global forecasts of annual demand for a subset of resources by 2050, compared to current supply. There are increases of over 200% for most minerals and from 610 to 19,000% increases required for hydrogen production and carbon capture and storage respectively. The left side of the diagram shows estimates of supply shortfalls given current known resources and development trends. The shortfalls are worrying. They range from over 80% for cobalt and almost 30% for lithium. Clearly, discovery of new resources is needed to decarbonise the world's economy. To achieve the shift from fossil fuels, the International Energy Agency estimates annual clean energy investment worldwide will need to more than triple by 2030 to around 4 trillion US dollars. That's a big opportunity for Australia's resources sector. Yet, given that developing these mineral and energy resources is estimated to require 1.5 to 2 times more water, we need to simultaneously support investment in finding more water and using it more sustainably. Australia's resources sector is the backbone of the Australian economy. The sector accounts for 18% of GDP, employs over 200,000 people and accounts for two-thirds of Australia's total merchandise exports valued at $460 billion in the last financial year. Australia is already the largest global producer of six commodities and is ranked second and third for another six. As well as supplying resources to the world, the sector is beginning to decarbonise, thanks to our abundant renewable solar and wind potential. This includes decarbonisation of extraction itself, through electrification, hydrogen generation and carbon capture and storage, as well as seizing new opportunities that add downstream value through processing and manufacturing. However, resources are not infinite, so we'll need a pipeline of new projects 
to meet future demand under net zero scenarios. This is where pre-competitive geoscience comes in, to provide baseline information on where new resources might be found and developed successfully. Of course, mine or hydrocarbon field closure does not mean the end of opportunities. The site itself, mine waste or depleted reservoirs can be reused and repurposed and we are working to open these opportunities across Australia. And recycling is certainly important. The International Energy Agency estimates recycling will account for 10% of demand by 2040. But all low emission pathways require us to increase supply to meet changing demand for certain resources. So, for now, I want to turn your attention to the search for new resources, and specifically minerals, given their pervasiveness in the net zero scenarios. Annual global expenditure for minerals exploration is currently less than half of that during the 2012 mining boom and double that expended in the 1980s and 1990s. Globally and in Australia, on average it takes about 15 years from beginning of exploration to mine production and over 1,000 failed attempts in the process. Given these constraints for Australia and the world to meet our net zero targets, the time to invest in finding those new resources to meet future demand is now. Globally, the race is on. Now is the time for Australia to prepare and position itself for the inevitable surge in capital investment. Another way of viewing mineral exploration spend is in terms of global market share. Since 2015, Australia's share has risen from 8 to 18%. Over the same period, US and Canada's shares have also risen. Australia's recovery of global market share follows a long-term decline from a high of 23% in the early to mid-1990s. Companies said the reason for the exodus from Australia was that our exploration search base was exhausted. In short, they thought there was nothing left to be found. If there was nothing left to be found, why would companies be investing more in Australia in exploration? Something must have changed. In 2014, there was a large symposium in Adelaide focused on this problem under the banner of Uncover. Its aim was to highlight that while the surface of Australia may have been explored for traditional commodities, it is possible to unlock new exploration frontiers at depth. A new frontier that spans up to 80% of Australia's land surface. The following year, the Uncover Roadmap was written. It has helped shape the design and the direction of the Exploring for the Future program, as well as the State and Territory Geological Survey programs, research in academia, and the focus for the Minex Cooperative Research Centre. We attribute the turnaround in Australia's share of exploration investment to this collective effort. Turning around exploration expenditure was a necessary step, but the question is, has it translated into discoveries? One useful way of looking at this question is to calculate the discovery performance or return on investment per region. The analysis is a simple division of the total estimated net present day value of discoveries by industry exploration expenditure. We use a decadal average to minimise the effects of the delays between discovery, drill-out expenditure and reporting. Here, you can see that at the turn of the century, exploration was highly profitable, with big returns or near break-even costs. Unfortunately, since then, mineral resource discovery has become a lot harder. All regions have gone backwards, with many making a loss. This is a worrying trend as the exploration industry has to attract capital investment to survive. Currently, there are only two regions with positive returns. Africa is one, and explorers are telling us that it is still a largely underexplored continent, and so it is, by comparison, easier to find mineral deposits. Australia is the other. Given the challenge of exploring through cover, it is perhaps the hardest exploration destination in the world, so it is encouraging to see that it is currently the most profitable. From 2012 to 2021, Australia, with 12% of global minerals exploration spend, found 19% of global discoveries, representing 22% of total value created. So, what's the secret? To answer this question, we'll narrow in on the record of discoveries over the last five years and focus on just the world-class discoveries, which are those with an estimated net present-day value of over 200 million US dollars. Since 2017, there have been 31 discoveries of this type, with eight in Australia. Importantly, 12 of the global mineral discoveries were underpinned by pre-competitive geoscience. Without that information, they may not have happened. Australia particularly stands out. 
in that six of our eight discoveries were supported by pre-competitive geoscience, all of which were in greenfield areas. While brownfield discoveries are certainly valuable, you could argue that greenfield discoveries are even more so, as their discovery opens up whole new provinces where it is likely other deposits will be found. It's important to now ask what information led to these discoveries. In this table, each of the global mineral discoveries underpinned by pre-competitive geoscience are listed in alphabetical order and coloured as greenfield, green, or brownfield, brown. There are a few things to note. First, the discoveries span a wide range of commodities and mineral system types, with a bias to gold and copper in line with company exploration expenditure. Second, and most interestingly, the top of the ore deposit in all of the Australian discoveries is at a greater depth than all the deposits discovered elsewhere. It seems the uncover strategy has worked. Finally, there is also a mix of the type of pre-competitive data and information being used, and many of the discoveries relied on a combination of data sources. This shows the value of multidisciplinary studies, value-added science products, and long-term custodianship of legacy exploration information by the government-funded geological surveys. These discoveries are clear evidence that government investment in pre-competitive geoscience data and analysis has translated into mineral discoveries. And while Australia's pre-competitive geoscience approach may not be a silver bullet to resourcing net zero, it is delivering a big step change in discoveries that, at the same time, provides significant returns to Australia and all Australians. I now want to move on to this last point. Given the importance of pre-competitive geoscience, Geoscience Australia commissioned Deloitte to quantify its value to the Australian economy. Here I want to re-emphasise and expand on the report Minister King launched today in her opening remarks. The study is based on input-output style economic modelling, based on assessments that 80 to 94% of the resources industry in Australia uses pre-competitive geoscience produced by federal and state and territory geological surveys in their exploration. This percentage is based on systematic data gathered through industry engagement over the last three years, covering minerals as well as oil and gas companies, but excluding coal and iron ore. As such, the estimates are considered conservative. Noting that it takes time for pre-competitive geoscience data to be used in the private sector exploration activities, and ultimately discovery and development, Deloitte assessed it supported a direct economic contribution in the 2021-2022 financial year of $5.5 billion of direct value added and over 24,000 full-time equivalent jobs in exploration and mining support services, and $70.5 billion of direct value added and over 55,000 full-time equivalent jobs in minerals and oil and gas extraction. The analysis highlights that pre-competitive data and information provides the foundation for economic activity in downstream resource exploration and extraction industries worth over 1,000 times the original expenditure. I encourage you to peruse the Deloitte report, but now I want to turn your attention specifically to the showcase and the Exploring for the Future program. Given the wide benefits of pre-competitive geoscience I've highlighted in my talk, the Australian Government has invested $225 million over eight years in the Exploring for the Future program. This diagram shows how the Exploring for the Future program activities and outputs are leading to tangible outcomes and impacts for all Australians. Next, you will hear highlights of our science journey from Dr. Carol Zanotta, the Exploring for the Future program's Senior Science Advisor. In the meantime, I want to quickly highlight some key impacts from the program so far. Perhaps the greatest direct impact of the Exploring for the Future program to date has been the stimulation of new exploration activity across vast areas of the country, in regions that have received minimal to no prior attention. It is opening new exploration frontiers like this that are increasing Australia's share of global exploration expenditure I mentioned earlier. We track these impacts by asking companies who pick up new tenements for their feedback. There are now 49 companies exploring across 450 new tenements covering over 240,000 square kilometres. Most are clustered between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa, a region that has been the focus of the program until last year. At last year's showcase, you heard from some of these companies and how they are using pre-competitive geoscience information to explore. So today, it's my pleasure to release two new return on investment reports that contain case studies on the use of Exploring for the Future program outputs to support development of our nascent hydrogen sector and help inform sustainable measurement of our groundwater resources. They show that, at a minimum, these activities are cost neutral and can also provide significant returns to the Australian economy and government. 
The hydrogen case studies assessed by Deloitte focused on uptake of the hydrogen economic fairways tool to accelerate investment decisions, stimulation of natural hydrogen tenement uptake by companies in South Australia, benefits of research into hydrogen salt storage, and the value of techno-economic assessments of green steel production. The groundwater case studies assessed by Alluvium focused on the utility of national hydrogeological mapping and the social, environmental, cultural and economic benefits of the South Stewart Corridor project in the Northern Territory. Details of these assessments and the role of pre-competitive geoscience is outlined in each of the reports and I encourage you to download each for more information. Having highlighted the impacts of the Exploring for the Future program, I should stress it does not occur in a vacuum. It continues to build on our national coverage of pre-competitive geoscience data and knowledge. Taking into consideration decisions made using our legacy data at the same time period since 2017, together these data sources supported a total of 110 companies to explore across 825 new tenements covering over 320,000 square kilometres. That's almost one and a half times the size of the state of Victoria. As our data acquisition and analysis programs are national in scale, we have had the privilege of engaging with over 26,000 individual landholders across Australia. This includes letterbox notifications of upcoming aerial surveys through to detailed discussions concerning sampling and deployment of instruments. Given the scale and scope of the program, a key focus for us has been to engage meaningfully and respectfully with First Nations Australians. This includes listening, learning and establishing mutually beneficial partnerships. So far we have four partnerships initiated by traditional owner communities where they are seeking to establish two-way knowledge sharing based on agreed priorities, such as understanding local geology and groundwater systems, passing on knowledge to the next generation or improving mapping of country. This is a very important part of our work so that all Australians benefit from pre-competitive geoscience. Tomorrow my colleague Meredith Orr will outline some of our activities and, and progress in achieving these outcomes and I encourage you to tune into her presentation. To conclude, pre-competitive geoscience is essential for Australia and the world's transition to net zero as it enables and accelerates the discovery of the resources we will all need. It is providing positive returns on investment for minerals, energy and groundwater and it is supporting a wide range of social, environmental and cultural benefits. We will have the opportunity to discuss these benefits in more detail with our esteemed panellists after the next presentation by Dr Carol Zanotta. I hope you enjoy the showcase and find value in the impressive suite of new data, information and progress updates coming out of the Exploring for the Future program. With 10 months to go, we are focused on delivering the vast quantities of new data, information and knowledge and working to ensure sustained investment in pre-competitive geoscience continues to enable Australia to meet its national and international goals. Thank you for your attention today. I'll now hand you back to Steve to continue with our showcase. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Andrew. Some really impressive figures and impact in there. Great to hear about that. And also some really interesting stories and science that sits behind it. And that's what we're going to hear a lot more from in the next two days. Um, so on that, just a reminder that the showcase will continue over the next two days. And we have four sessions uh, over that time covering highlights from the Exploring for the Future program. If you're not already registered, just follow the links on the showcase webpage, where you, which is where you should have registered for this session, and join us both tomorrow and Thursday. If you want further details on what's in the program, that's also available from the webpage. So now I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, but actually just before I do, I want to remind everyone that for these presentations, can you please post questions in the Q&A section on, um, on the Teams or on the, on the um, site where you're viewing these talks. So it should be a little um, drag down at the top there for Q&A. If you could put your questions in there, that'll be great because we will have a Q&A session at the end of presentations. So on to the next presentation, and that's by Carol Zanotta and he is the Senior Science Advisor for the Exploring for the Future program. Carol has 20 years experience in undertaking and leading pre-competitive geoscience programs focused on understanding Australia's resource potential. He holds a BSc from the University of New South Wales, an MSc from Royal 
Holloway University, London, and a PhD in Geophysics and Geology from the University of Cambridge. Thank you, Carole. Thank you, Steve, for that kind introduction. We heard from the Minister and Andrew about the resource intensity of the transition to net zero and the value of pre-competitive geoscience in securing future resource supply. My aim now is to provide an overview of the Exploring for the Future program by reflecting on where we have come from, what we have achieved, and how this positions us for the future. When we started the program back in 2016, our science drivers were to open up new provinces for mineral production, enhance energy supply, and secure water resources, especially groundwater. Those goals remain as current today as they were when we started. But naturally, new drivers have come along since. Our minerals work was informed by the Uncover Roadmap, which sought to unlock the search space at depth for precious and base metals. Since then, critical minerals have risen in importance. That search space is also relevant to them, but one could argue that the surface has also re-emerged as an exploration frontier. And you will hear how the chemistry and the geophysics that we are collecting is feeding into unlocking that search space again. Our work on energy resources has been informed by the onshore basin inventory, which provides a snapshot of our understanding and knowledge gaps in frontier basin regions. And it's been super useful to select the basins that we focus on, such as the South Nicholson Basin. But since that time, alternative fuel sources to hydrocarbons have risen in importance, such as hydrogen. And we heard the minister mention the release of products concerning salt storage for hydrogen and how they've stimulated exploration. And Andrew Feitz is going to talk about more about this later. And Tehani Palu is going to expand on how we're enhancing our basin inventory and positioning us for the future. Our groundwater work has been informed by the National Groundwater Strategic Framework, which highlights the importance of data to inform decision making. Since then, the Nature Positive Plan has been released, highlighting the importance of regional information to improve nature positive outcomes and accelerate approvals all at the same time. So what specifically is the science that we are doing to meet these needs? I'm going to cover that by focusing on four core themes which build on each other. We're going to start with Australia-wide geoscience datasets. To me, these are the fundamental building blocks that all the other bits of work that we do is based on, and we continually to build up consistent coverages. The datasets we collect are resource agnostic that can be applied to many different commodities, and they provide the infrastructure for innovation and discovery. For many of you, when I was talking about that, I suspect you had these four datasets in mind. The surface geology, the magnetics and gravity, and the radiometrics. They are super useful, and I dare say there'll be very few geoscience projects around the country which don't use them. Since 1970, the magnetics and gravity has underpinned at least 39% of base metal discoveries, which are now producing mines. But we don't rest on our laurels. It's not to say that these data sets are complete, and we know that other countries are trying to emulate this and rapidly advancing their coverages. So we have continued to improve them as part of the Exploring for the Future program. But importantly, we have also been levelling them to make them consistent. A very important component to this is the radiometric map, which maps the surface and near surface and is stimulating the search for rare earth elements across Australia as well as lithium. What has been transformational about the Exploring for the Future program has been the ability to expand the diversity of national coverages that we now have at hand. We map the Australian geology from the surface down to depths of hundreds of kilometres. We've been able to use 30 years of satellite imagery to expose the surface of Australia at its barest. We'll be able to probe individual grains of minerals to come up with isotopic atlases that cover the country. There are so many of these data sets that I'd love to go into, but I just want to give you some examples that focus on the geochemistry, geophysics and geology. Patrice de Caritat has an amazing presentation about the diversity of data sets that, that are coming out that are particularly focused on the surface. At its heart, they are underpinned by the National Geochemical Survey of Australia. The samples are stored in our repository here in Canberra and we'll be able to utilise all of those to improve our geochemical, isotopic and heavy mineral coverages. But we don't stop at providing individual points. We have tools to be able to search through what they provide and we're starting to stitch up our understanding 
to come up with national grids. And this is just one example of one of the 10 major element maps that we're releasing. It leverages of advancements in machine learning and is going to be super useful for soil mapping, for establishing geochemical baselines and for exploration. I encourage you to tune into Patrice as he talks about it. If we go a bit deeper to image the top few hundred meters uh, of the earth, a transformational data set has been OzAEM. Houston Lee Cooper will provide an overview of how OzAEM, Australia's national airborne electromagnetic coverage, has grown from nothing to this since 2017. It has fundamentally de-risked the application of this technique across many areas, and that's just with a 20 kilometer spacing. In 2022, the data set alone stimulated over 17 new exploration projects. It's been used to assess groundwater potential and management across many areas, and support road building infrastructure projects. I suspect many of you have already seen this image. So what I want to do now is show you how we're going to make it even better. Here, I'm showing you different views of the data that we collect. On the left-hand side is an extract of what I've just shown you. On the right-hand side is its interpretation. And in the middle is the result from being able to embrace the uncertainty that is the series of models that fit the data that we've collected and being able to exploit it. It's amazing. By embracing uncertainty, we actually sharpen the image and we can accelerate our decision making. What I mean by this is that if you're looking for groundwater across the regions, you'd look at the series of models which are most conductive and therefore show the most robust resistors. That's where the fresh groundwater lenses are most likely to be. If you're looking to explore for mineral deposits, you'd be interested in the conductors. So you go to the series of models, the P10 set, which uh, is most resistive and look for the conductors and so on. We are aiming to roll this out across the entire OzAM coverage. And it's only possible because of the deep investment in the code base that underpins the development of this work. We release it for free on GitHub. It's called HiQGA. And it's also possible because of our access to supercomputing. The panels that I'm showing you here took over 2.25 million CPU hours to run. I'm so glad that the national computational infrastructure uh, that we use is one of the two supercomputers in the world that runs off renewable energy. Stay tuned to see how this rolls out. Imaging the Earth a bit deeper is OzLamp. It also looks at the conductivity structure of the Earth. Every time we release new products from the, we learn something new. So I'm so pleased to say that we are releasing a new model covering North East and Queensland by Jingming Duan. What we learned from this is that the big Carpentaria conductivity anomaly that is well known within the community is actually fragmented. And we also learn here from the 40 kilometer depth slice that the lower to mid crust is conductive beneath Georgetown. Last year we released uh, uh, studies that show that these conductors at those depths are super important for focusing gold mineralization. To complement OzLamp, we are rolling out OzArray. This is a national uh, initiative to map the velocity structure and discontinuities throughout the whole lithosphere. We currently have 148 broadband seismometers deployed simultaneously across Australia. This is our largest deployment ever and it's there to establish a backbone for this emerging technique. It will provide important information from which more detailed arrays, such as the Geological Survey of Western Australia's WARA, can build from. A key motivation from this work was the lithosphere sphenosphere boundary, which is shown here on the right, and that it controls the distribution of base metal deposits hosted in sedimentary basins. But in order to be able to make those maps, we need to have calibration points. And Zach from the ANU has been able to increase our coverage of xenocrysts, which sample the geology down to depths of tens to hundreds of kilometers from grains that have been plucked up by volcanoes from 15 sites across Australia to over 50. There was actually a recent publication which showed a new tomographic model of Australia, and they missed out just one station in the Kimberley. And with that, the entire Kimberley Craton, that thick zone of lithosphere disappeared. And it highlights why we need to invest in these types of surveys so that we all have confidence about what the first order architecture of the Australian tectonic plate is. As we wait for the information to roll in from that array, 
we are analysing our previous surveys that have been uh, that have been spaced at 50 kilometre spacing. And Baba Kadrani is going to present an amazing talk that shows how these correlate with active uh, reflection seismic sources. And it's amazing. Now we don't stop at just collecting the geochemistry or the geophysics. Our aim is to grow our understanding of the geology, the rocks of Australia. So we interpret the information that we collect. Eloise Bayer would present our progress towards a national layered solid geology coverage where we strip off progressively younger rocks to reveal the rocks that lie beneath and we try and work out at what depths they reside and how they correlate across the whole country. Importantly, we don't just stop at providing these data coverages. The Exploring for the Future program has been a great step to establish an evolving inventory of Australia's resource potential to highlight opportunities and inform decision making. Ariane Ford will provide an overview of how we've advanced our national mineral potential assessments over the last year. We do these by understanding how elements are concentrated within the earth through various processes. And individual elements are concentrated through a series of different processes and that's why we have multiple maps for the same commodities. Like for example here, we've got two maps where copper features, another two maps where lead and zinc features. We don't just stop at combining information making these maps, we invest in growing understanding of those processes that lead to the concentration of these metals. And Yevgeny Bastrikov will showcase our latest efforts in sedimentary hosted base metal systems and also what is it that we can do when we go into frontier regions to work out whether frontier areas are fertile or not for different mineral systems. Now the timeline from when exploration starts to development can be long, yet there's a great urgency to locate sources for critical minerals quickly. Jane Thorne will talk about our work on the Atlas of Australian Mine Waste and how we're going about sampling it as it has the potential to bring new sources of critical minerals online quickly and also, in, I suppose, decrease our environmental legacy of past mining operations. To assess our groundwater potential nationally, we've been trying to advance on our efforts from 1987, which was the last time we published a national hydrological map through our predecessor organisation, the BMR. Stephen Lewis will present how we've subdivided the country into 42 hydrogeological provinces, which are stacked, and we're rapidly compiling information about what we know and what we don't know across these regions. And in a similar sense to the basin inventory, we're then using that to work out where can we do follow-up studies where there are large data gaps. What I'm showing you here is an example from Katithanga, Lake Air Basin where we've compiled geological information spanning Northern Territory, Queensland, South Australia and New South Wales to come up with a consistent understanding of groundwater across this region. Here I'm showing you the first indicative water table map across the area, but it's underpinned through amazing understanding of stratigraphic correlations that lie beneath it. Beneath this basin are older basins, such as the Simpson and Paderka, and we're assessing these for the energy potential. We're actually leveraging from some of the work from the groundwater as we need to understand those processes to understand what is the energy potential of these basins. And our assessments of hydrocarbon potential and CO2 sequestration storage go hand in hand. Barry Bradshaw is going to present on this work and encourage you to tune in. Now in the past, before the Exploring for the Future program, normally this is the point where we stop. We provide the geological information. But the Exploring for the Future program has enabled us to go beyond that, to look how geology interacts with economic considerations. The tool that we've developed is economic fairways. The various commodities that it can assess are listed here. What it does, it takes into consideration geological considerations like what is the depth to a deposit, along with the distribution of infrastructure, roads, railways, ports, energy, as well as royalty structures and the cost of mining to come up with first order net present day value maps of a project anywhere across Australia. It's a phenomenal capability that some companies are now using routinely to inform their investment decisions, both in minerals and hydrogen exploration. This capability is allowing us to take the next step and pose questions of what is the opportunity for Australia of decarbonisation of the resources sector. The example here is of a map 
of areas which have economic potential to develop hydrogen resources and the distribution of our iron ore. If you couple these two together, it becomes a map of our potential for green steel production. We've come up with costs of what that is, and we're running a workshop in Perth on Wednesday the 30th of August. And you can tune in to our, uh, to our website to register if you like. Now we can't do everything everywhere. And in a lot of Australia, the geological uncertainty is such that we need to undertake focused regional projects. The locations are informed by where we've done the national assessments. Our most recent one that we've completed is between Tennant Creek and Mount Isa, and Andrew showed the tenant map and the exploration that it has stimulated. What I want to do now is just focus on one of our other projects, the Delamarian and Upper Darling. In the Delamarian, we're assessing its potential for convergent margin hosted mineral systems. Yangbo Chang will talk about this work. The map here shows the amazing array of data sets that we've collected. These include higher resolution airborne electromagnetics, deep reflection seismic profiles, higher density infills of magnetotellurics, and extensive geochemical and isotopic characterization of the province. All of those data sets are starting to, I suppose, develop their own information, and we're starting to be able to link them together to come up with an integrated and holistic understanding of this area. But importantly, we're also able to test our assumptions, our models through drilling and Yambo is going to be releasing the first results from uh, our collaborative drilling projects through the MINEX CRC and the National Drilling Initiative. It's allowing us to start answering questions, how different is the Delamarian to the Lachlan, uh, which hosts world-class deposits in the Macquarie Arc? So please do tune in uh, to Yangbo. Just to the northeast of the Delamarian lies the, the Upper Darling River and towns like Vilcania which had three years of drought, which broke in 2020. So there is a great need there to find water sources to get through periods of drought. Sarah Buckerfield last year presented a great talk about the groundwater systems across this region. And this year, she's gonna be presenting a talk on the groundwater dependent ecosystems uh, across the area. But I couldn't resist showing you some of the results of the continued interpretation of the data sets they've been collecting. So the slice that you're looking at here is at a depth of about 40 metres and it shows the conductivity from airborne electromagnetics across this region. Now, conductors and resistors are non-unique, but in this case, it's most likely that the blue regions are areas of potential fresh water. That big pool that you can see that has the yellow squares within it, those are places where we've applied surface magnetic resonance. It's a non-invasive technique which can infer the hydraulic properties down at depth. It's a way which we can work out, is there water down there uh, without having to drill? And the results are shown in those blue bell-shaped curves. It turns out that at those depths, we have porosities up to 30%. Now the pool isn't huge, but it's probably enough to get the town through drought water spells. We haven't confirmed it yet through drilling, and we are in conversations uh, with our New South Wales counterparts. So I suppose I'm really excited to see what comes out of this work. The data sets and the information that I've covered are just a small fraction of what you're going to hear and what is going to come out of the program. Many of it is world-class and world-leading, developed by an incredible team of scientists, and it's a great privilege for me to be able to present uh, their work. We are very keen that the data that we provide has enduring value, and so we invest in the storage of this information, but we know that it's of no use unless it can be accessible and used by you. As such, we invest a lot in that particular part of the process. Simon van der Willem will showcase the functionality of our online portal. It's amazing now that you can now take a reflection seismic profile from anywhere across Australia and visualize it in 3D all through a portal. Like, I mean, that's putting the information at your fingertips. But that sort of information is very useful to the people that are going to use it uh, in their exploration and resource management decisions. But there is a growing, I suppose, group of non-technical experts who say, well, hold on, I want to know what you came up with. I want to be able to make decisions uh, based on that. Communities are interested. And Catherine Waltenberg will be speaking about our journey to distill what we know to a non-technical audience quickly and intuitively so decision makers and communities can be informed. To improve the equity and access of our information, 
We've also started partnerships with First Nation organisations. Meredith Orr will talk about this work where we're learning and listening and working out in what sense do our data holdings and our capabilities can be applied to their priority areas. Now, it's not only the non-technical audience that wants the essence of the information distilled, so we are continuing our popular extended abstract series. These are short format papers, if you like, of four to six pages, which summarize the essence of what we found and provide links to the data sets and more detailed reports. It's my pleasure to release another 15 of these, and they're available on our website. All of this work would not be possible without the collaboration across the Australian government, the state and territory geological surveys and natural resource management bodies, cooperative research centres, national collaborative research infrastructure, and academia in Australia and around the world. We thank you for partnering with us and enabling this program. So to conclude, I hope this presentation has given you a flavour of what the Exploring for the Future program is delivering and how the various bits fit together. I hope Andrew and I have been able to convince you that the data and assessments we provide is infrastructure for our future, which is making a difference to resource exploration and management. Given resource projects, take about 16 years from the beginning of a company's exploration journey to final development. In order to resource the net zero transition, now is the perfect time to invest in this type of information. I hope you can appreciate that what we're delivering is setting us up for the future. And I hope you enjoy the showcase. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Carol. That was a great presentation. I know we've had a few questions online already asking about the availability of the presentations. And just to let you know that um, the slides for the presentations should be available before or by the, about the end of this session. And the plan is also to have the videos available um, later this week. So maybe even as soon as tomorrow, but definitely later this week. So stay tuned for that. Well, now I've been joined by both Andrew and Carol after their fantastic presentations. And um, don't forget that if you want to ask questions that you can use the Q and A channel. Uh, please don't use the chat function, look at the Q&A channel on your uh, devices. Now, we've got a couple of questions already. I'm going to start with one, though, and that's for you, Andrew. I'm going to put the pressure on you. So welcome, and now let's get to work. Uh, the Deloitte report indicates pre-competitive geoscience supports 3.5% of GDP. That's a big number. You said 80 to 94% of exploration in Australia uses pre-competitive geoscience data. How has that share worked out? Uh, thanks, Steve. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, to be honest, until the report came out, we didn't know what, and certainly hadn't imagined it would be quite so large. Um, Concerning the use of pre-competitive geoscience by industry, uh, we had suspected that it would be in around the ballpark, around that number, as it's so central to understanding the resource potential of the region, as, as, as we've pointed out. Um, so as part of this phase of the Exploring for the Future program, we've wanted to quantitative, quantitatively measure the use of our data and information. So we uh, actually contracted a dedicated person, the person was David Upton, um, to uh, contact companies on a monthly basis who pick up new tenement, exploration tenements, sorry, or make new discoveries and ask them what led to that exploration in that area or the, their activities that they, that they did. Um, and in addition to that, we've also been sending a member of the GA team to industry-focused conferences and events to talk with companies about what information they relied upon in their exploration activities. And this sort of informational business intelligence that we gathered from those activities gives us a very clear picture that, you know, depending on the commodity, 80 to 94% of industry activity has been underpinned by that, by our pre-competitive geoscience, which is just fantastic to see. Um, I think more importantly though, or perhaps just as importantly, um, collecting this type of information helps us to understand and learn what types of data and information that companies are using 
and that what type of data and information we can provide as a national geoscience organization that would make the biggest material difference to discovery rates and exploration activities. Um, and I should also add, I think it, I think um, might have mentioned um, during the presentation that the Deloitte report that we published, it just published today, or Minister King released today, didn't include coal and iron ore, but they do make the point that the critical mineral sector is expected to become as big as the coal industry. And I guess it's really exciting for us to be at the forefront at, at, of helping that sector get established and, and grow and, and become perhaps as big as the coal industry. And that you know our, our work and our advice and our science is being used extensively to, to support that. So I hope that goes to answering the question for people there, Steve, thanks. No, that was great. Great to hear a little bit more information there, Andrew. We've got another question that's come in for you, Carol. So get ready. I'm going to call on you now. And this is a question from Peter Morrissey. If Deloitte showed over $70 billion potential in mineral extraction, what would the potential be if we added mineral processing instead of just extraction? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for that, Steve and Peter. Yeah, so I think the government generally recognises that there is a great opportunity to uh, to move down the value chain. Um, in terms of how big that is, um, I don't know, but I think it's it, it's um, it's orders of um, it, it's it's up to an order of magnitude in, in terms of larger when we go down the the value path. Um, so I don't have a particular number for you, but I certainly agree with the sentiment of the question uh, that there is a lot of value to be gained uh, by going down that path. Yeah, I think Peter's making a good point there about really that whole downstream um, value add that we see with, with this work. So, yeah, good one there. Oh, Anna Petz in South Australia. Thank you, Anna. Good to know you're out there. Anna says or asks, is there a particular pre-competitive data set, set which has had a noticeable impact on exploration from the Deloitte study or even just from your own observations? And I might open that one up to both of you, but who, who you know, anyone would like to go first? Please do. I'm Andrew, happy to start. Great. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I'm happy to ha start off and perhaps throw to Carole. Uh, for a bit more detail, I, I guess um, I show it's a great question, Anna, and thank you for for the for the question. Um, I guess I showed in my presentation there was a table of the um, recent um, major discoveries, uh, and then on the right hand side of the slide there was a, a table of the, some columns that had the different types of uh, pre-competitive geoscience that we did, including the data sets, some of the evaluated products, and also the legacy or custodianship of the data. Um, and it showed that there was actually quite a quite a good mix of different data sets. There's the geophysics, the geology, and geochemistry, but also equally, almost equally as important, with the advances in the conceptual models that um, it's the you know, sort of scientific value add that we bring to that data. And I think you know having such uh, great scientists in this organisation and also other geological surveys around the country. Being able to utilize those, those national, in our case, data sets, and then bringing those together in innovative and novel ways really does help with understanding where the you know, relative pro, pro, um, prospectivity is across in a spatial sense across the country. Um, so in terms of the uptake of new exploration tenements I showed, we've gone actually gone through the exercise of attributing um, the key uh, data sets that stimulated the activity in that area. Um, and I know that Carol talked about that, and so I'll throw him in a second. But I guess the key, again, I'll go to that point, is that the information that's being gleaned from this intelligence that we're gathering is really helping us make decisions about what data sets and what science that we should do to continue um, supporting exploration um, across, across you know, minerals, energy, and groundwater uh, across the country. Um, and then the other bit of that is is bringing the lens of internationally how do we actually you know stay ahead of our competitors in this game so so really that that information we're gleaning mostly for the first time in a quantitative sense is really really helping us make those decisions and help direct directing the science into the future and what we might do but Carol, I, I know you, you talked about this a little bit in your talk so i just wanted to throw to you to see whether you had any further insights that you wanted to provide 
Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I think it's a it's a great question, uh, and I completely agree with with everything that uh, uh, that you said. It is, I mean, when you kind of if you if you subdivide all those tenants into the national scale data sets, national resource potential, regional projects, there's about an equal attribution of the new tenement uptakes uh, across those. So I think it speaks to that the diversity is important. But when we are speaking to uh, to companies. Um, it does a lot are kind of uh, using the the higher resolution data sets that are available now. So these are things like uh, the geology maps from us and the geological surveys, the, the magnetics, the gravity, the radiometrics. And I really think that it is because of the resolution that these things provide. They, they, they provide an opportunity to test a lot of different targets. Yet, when we speak to companies, the great excitement is about the new things that are coming uh, online, which is the, you know, the MT, the AEM, uh, the passive seismic, the isotopic mapping. Um, and there's no reason why those can't have similar types of resolution, but we're sensing the earth in a completely different way uh, the, than we were before. If I can just loop back maybe though to, to, to the question that, because it focused on kind of the Deloitte study itself, um, so th that study looked at what is the proportion of, I suppose, bits of industry which are reliant upon pre-competitive geoscience. Uh, and it's those bits were, in a sense, predetermined by what the Australian Bureau of Statistics provides in the input-output tables. Um, so we kind of had a, a binary thing. Uh, are, are they being used to support the activity or, or, or are they not? Uh, we do have the more granular uh, information in terms of which actual data sets, and that's what Andrew and my responses were, were, were based on. But I, um, if I may, just one more thing, though, um, on this, uh, I know I'm kind of going on, but um, it, it's, you know, we're here, we're talking about minerals, right? Um, but this whole integration uh, and what we're looking at is equally applicable to oil and gas, which is what the Deloitte report focuses on. But that example that I showed of the upper Darling in terms of the, the fresh groundwater lenses, that's really the result of an integrated look at, at that particular area. And the thing that I find so fascinating is that this is probably one of the better studied river systems in Australia. Yet even there, we're discovering new things about the groundwater uh, potential. So uh, I think there's so much more to discover uh, from that as we apply these types of approaches of, of I suppose, searching the deep uh, across the, uh, the various commodities. Thank you. Uh, thanks to both Andrew and Carole there. Um, just another one. You mentioned that other so-called mature jurisdictions have also had increased share of exploration investment. Trying to avoid complacency, is there anything we can learn from those countries? Want to start, Carole? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, David, I think it's, uh, I think that's a great uh, it's a great question. Um, we do uh, so. We are, I think Andrew mentioned that uh, there are large increases in in uh, exploration share in both the US and in Canada. Um, we actually have a collaboration uh, with the US and Canada as part of the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, and that's where uh, we're trying to. I suppose, share our understanding of what concentrates critical minerals and how to benchmark approaches on how to best do mineral potential studies. So I think there is great value in, um, I suppose, leveraging each other's expertise uh, uh, across this, uh, across those areas, and then applying it to the geographically specific uh, circumstances which are in each one of our countries. So I think that's how we're, I suppose, trying to learn and also, I suppose, to, to trying to know, well, what, what are the approaches that, that, that are being adopted uh, across these different jurisdictions? Can I just add something there, Steve? Uh, yeah, well, I guess uh, just to give some um, con uh, detail to Carol's question, uh, answer to the question, one thing that we've really relied on or really benefit from is working with the US Geological Survey around critical minerals um, because they potentially, well, they, they actually approach the problem slightly differently to the way we do. And they have great expertise in understanding the relationships between critical minerals and, 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 all, and all bodies. And um, having that knowledge and being able to dovetail that with our mineral systems approach has been really, really useful for developing our predictive capabilities in places, perhaps in greenfield regions. So, so I think that there's definitely there's a, there's a science collaboration that we can that we can learn from. But as Carol mentioned too, in terms of their approaches to the problem, I think there's definitely something we can learn from that too. Okay, 
Thanks for that. This is a question from someone anonymous. The, um, the masked questioner wants to ask Andrew uh, if a if if there's a 1,000 time uplift in value of taxpayer funds from EFTF to the Australian economy, what's the plan for EFTF3, for, for want of a better word, name, uh, and feedback loop for all the geoscience studies to training the next generation of students studying geoscience at Australian universities? Great, Thank, thanks, Steve. I, I guess the, the, the question's on the premise that there will be an FTF3, um, and we're working very hard, of course. That we, I mean, this was proven. It's proven that this program and the type of thing we do works. So, so definitely, um, um, it's something that we're considering in, in talks with various people about what we might do next. Um, nothing obviously landed yet, but but in terms of the essence of the question around providing. Um, the information back to people uh, and, and, and in terms of training the next generation of students studying geosciences. Um, I'll, it's very important that we do that. There's no question. And um, part of Carol's presentation, he alluded to the fact that we're generating or developing a way of being able to feed our very technical information and science back into a variety of stakeholders. Um, through, uh, I won't steal Catherine's fun thunder because you'll have to tune in to, to see her presentation. But there is a but there is a, um, a a model by which we're going to do that. So that's one approach: is actually making sure that the work that we do is developed is delivered in a way that can help with training and education. Uh, we're also actively engaged in uh, in outreach, and I know Steve, this is something that's dear to your heart. Um, we, we definitely have a program at looking at um, improving our outreach to go to students and provide information that perhaps can um, co contribute to a variety of curriculum across Australia and schools. Um, and we've got a wonderful education uh, centre here at Geoscience Australia that are, are very active in that space. And of course, the information we provide is, is used by them uh, when necessary. And we have a, a fantastic program of also teaching the teachers who don't always feel confident about teaching geoscience to the students and it's about getting them confident in that space to do that. So, so there's definitely, even, even in the current program, we have expanded our, our remit in that area and pushing that very hard because we do recognize that, you know, Australia is going to need lots of geoscientists into the future. And we definitely have a role as a national geoscience organization as do the state and territory geological surveys, as well as our partners in, in academia and, and also the cooperative research centers to inspire that next generation of, 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 of geoscientists. And, and, and one way of doing that, as I said, is making the information uh, available to them in a way that's easily digestible, um, but also indicates the the significance and importance of what we do for the future of not only Australia but also the planet. Terrific. Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. In fact, I will just add to that a, an anecdote from just um, on my way to this very room. I had to walk through the foyer of Geoscience Australia to get here and we had um, our one of our schools visiting the education centre in the foyer and it was terrific to see them pouring over the new um, display that we have in our public space here that was funded by EFTF called The Rocks That Shape Australia. And the way that that doesn't just display the rocks and, and, the, and explain some of the science behind them, the way it then connects it to our society was really great to watch students looking at a limestone and also looking at a um, taxidermy wallaby next to it and making the links between, you know, geographical isolation and, and what those um, Southern Australian limestones mean. It's those sorts of stories that when you see the, 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 um, the schools engaging with that, that I know makes a big difference. So, you know, thank you to EFTF and, and to you for your support for that. Well, that actually wraps up our questions and you're about to, to lose me from the screens and some might say about time, but um, it's but the news gets even better because I'm about to hand over now to uh, Dr. Andrew Heap, Chief of Minerals, Energy and Groundwater 
Division at Geoscience Australia, and Andrew will be facilitating a panel discussion with leaders from government and industry. So over to you, Andrew, and thanks, Carol, also for your efforts. Okay, thanks, Steve, and thank you for helping us with the first part of our plenary session. So it's now my great pleasure to um, facilitate the next part of our plenary session, which is facilitating our today's panel discussion, which will be focused on um, the exploring the, for the future program and the, and the improvement of geoscience and its value, obviously, to society and government. And we have an esteemed panel of uh, industry experts, um, government experts um, with us today who have generously given up their time to help uh, explore some of the uh, key themes that we've been discussing and that have emerged through the so seven years now of the program. Um, before I go too far, um, I'd just like to introduce my esteemed colleagues. Uh, we First of all, we have Anthea Long, who is the head of division at the Minerals and Resources Division at the Depart Federal Department of Industry, Science and Resources. Uh, and the department provides policy um, uh, uh, public policy and advice uh, and industry facilitation and administers activities in relation to the exploration, development, investment and management of minerals and resources. And Anthea herself has over 20 years of public policy experience that ranges from senior government policy roles to community level implementation. So welcome, Anthea. Um, we also have Andrew McConville uh, with us today. Uh, Andrew is the Chief Executive of the Murray Darling Basin Authority or the MDBA. Uh, and Andrew leads the MDBA to prepare, implement, and review the integrated plan for the sustainable use of the basin's resources and operation of the River Murray. Uh, before his appointment at the MDBA in May 2022, Andrew was the CEO of the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, or APIA. Uh, and prior to joining APIA, Andrew worked for more than a decade with Syngenta, which is one of the world's leading agribusinesses. Agri and Andrew's last role with, with them was as the Global Head of External Affairs and Communication and was and based in Switzerland. Oh, very nice. Uh, Andrew holds a first class honours degree in agricultural economics from the University of New England and a Master of Science in Agricultural Economics from Oxford University. Uh, and then we have Dr. John Ronsky, who is the Director of Western Mining Services. Uh, and prior to joining Western Mining Services in 2007, John was the manager of strategy and generative services for BHP Billiton, mineral exploration, and global geoscience leader for WNC Resources Limited. John has more than 35 years of experience in the global mineral exploration industry, primarily focused on project generation, technical innovation, and exploration strategy development. He's on the board of several ASX listed mining and exploration companies. And in 2019, he was awarded the Order of Australia Medal for Services to Mining Industry and is the 2023 recipient of the Society of Economic Geology's Silver Medal. So welcome to you, John. And then our fourth panelist is Glenn Toogood, who is the General Manager Hydrogen and Clean Fuels with Entex. Glenn is responsible for the development of Entex's Hydrogen and Clean Fuel Strategy, securing early stage growth options in future facing clean energy commodities, ventures and innovation, and prior to joining Intex, Glenn held senior management positions in energy, resources, and aviation at companies that include Santos, Beach Energy, Qantas Airways, and ExxonMobil. So welcome to you, Glenn. So as this is a moderated discussion, we won't be taking any questions from the virtual room, but we have, have a series of topics for discussion that, as I said, were based on key themes to emerge from the last seven years of the Exploring for the Future program. And I'd just like to again thank both or Anthea, Andrew, John and Glenn for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. So if we move to the discussion now, I guess what I'd like to do first is to just expand perhaps or, or get your reflections and thoughts on some of the concepts that Carol and I uh, touched on earlier in our presentations. So maybe if I could just start with you first, Anthea. And I just wondered if you could let us know what, what are the current government priorities to support the resources sector? And how does pre competitive geoscience contribute to realizing the outcomes for those priorities? Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I think resources and the sector has been hugely important to Australia's past and is, um, is equally important for our future. 
So the sector makes a significant contribution to the Australian economy through earnings, taxes and high skilled jobs. And we know there's enormous opportunities for the sector moving forward, particularly in relation to supporting the global transition to net zero. Um, and we've already heard, Andrew, in your introduction, you talked about the significant global demand and the shortfalls that we're seeing in demand for um, minerals required to go into clean energy technology, such as batteries, solar panels and electric vehicles. And so to realise these opportunities, the government recognises that we need a strong, responsible and inclusive resources sector and that it needs to be equipped to confront and really kind of capitalise on these global trends and changes that we're seeing. So fundamentally, if we're to meet this significant increase in demand for minerals, we are going to need to look at increasing supply in, in every way that we can. So this is going to mean uh, looking at recycling, um, using new technology and data to extract minerals from tailings and, and also increasing our exploration. So in this context, uh, pre-competitive geoscience is going to be really critical and it can help improve discovery rates and lower the risks associated with exploration. Um, you know, we know that free competitive geoscience data can underpin investment in new resources projects um, and in doing so accelerate that resources development that we need. Um, but also initiatives like the Atlas of Mine Waste that Carol mentioned, um, these sorts of initiatives are going to be really integral for extracting even more minerals and value from the existing sources that we have. Um, so I think, you know, in an increasingly competitive global context, um, you know, we can really see that this sort of data and the work um, that we're doing around improving our geoscience is, is a really, um, you know, important lever for, for government and policymakers um, to be able to kind of meet these challenges. Right. Thank you, Anthea. And look, we've always been very, very well supported by yourself and the department, and you know, and, and several ministers over the period of the program to to do that. And so it's it's great to hear that you know there's still a, obviously a role for pre-competitive geoscience into the future. Um, maybe if I could turn to you now, John, from an ind from a mineral industry perspective, I just wondered if I could get your reflections, uh, maybe building upon what Anthea's mentioned in terms of the role of pre-competitive geoscience and the role of the Exploring for the Future program into the future. I just wondered what you what your, your thoughts were about what does Australia's resources sector need to look like into the future to achieve net zero by 2050? And again, if you could perhaps reflect on how pre-competitive geoscience, such as that taken by the Exploring for the Future program, might assist in that transition. We've heard a little bit about it, but I'm keen to hear your views from an industry perspective. Sure. Thank you, Andrew. Um, look, the, the bottom line is the only way that we are going to achieve these goals in terms of all this extra demand, with, with, you know, which we've heard so much about today, is through the discovery of brand new provinces, uh, you know, completely new regions. And, you know, you know, that's what we've been good at in Australia. I mean, no one knew about the potential of the Gawler Craton and, and South Australia until the discovery of Olympic Dam. Now it's, it's an absolute sort of world uh, dominating province. We've got another exciting example emerging in a really remote part of our country around Lake Mackay, the, the Erolon region, where uh, companies such as WA1 and Encounter are uh, unravelling, uh, revealing what, what's probably going to be one of the greatest carbonatite provinces in the world with all the implications for critical metals such as the rare earths and, and, and niobium. And of course, why would we go ever go to such a remote part of Australia in the first instance? Because we saw features that were in pre-competitive geoscience data. Otherwise, you know, the, the, it, it's sort of a barren featureless landscape. You know, you, you wouldn't go there with it without that data. So, uh, you know, what, while um, e existing resources will continue to develop incrementally, the absolute key is finding these new provinces and looking differently looking in places that people haven't looked before. And, you know, pre-competitive geoscience data uh, totally underpins it, as it did the discovery of Olympic Dam, right? Olympic Dam was a feature that was in the BMR, your your, your precursor, uh, you know, the data sets that, that were, were collected in 1975, it was sitting there as a feature that, that led to that world-class discovery. 
my feeling is that there's probably lots of those features in the data that you've already got. And as an industry, we, you know, we 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 probably haven't necessarily caught up with all all the value that's in there and, and all the additional value that, that that's going to be generated. But uh, I, I think the short answer to your question is, we need to find the new provinces. That means looking at places that, you know. Maybe no one's put a hole in. If I go back to the the sort of Lake Mackay region, uh, until Encounter drilled the first hole a few years ago, there was no drill hole within 300 kilometres. Right, that you know that's the sort of opportunity that can come, and it will it will it will only come through the gateway of pre-competitive geoscience. Thanks, John. Um, and uh, I'm curious in your comments around uh, finding those new provinces. Um, I presume. It'll be a mixture of finding some of these big deposits in some places, but probably also a series of little smaller deposits, perhaps. Do you want to comment on sure. where Thank, you think Andrew. those opportunities might be? Look, yeah. I, I, I suppose the, the, the point is that initial province discovery then opens up a region for, uh, you know, additional incremental discovery and there's we kind of know this idea that there's sort of a power law size frequency distribution of deposits in any region we we usually get onto the biggest ones first we usually don't fully recognize their size but but then over time we we fill out that distribution like we found olympic dam and now we subsequently we found uh prominent hill Carapatina, Oak Dam West that kind of fill out that distribution. You know, the West Musgrave is another great example, nation building project in the centre of Australia, a $2 billion development that, that, that's that gone ahead now. First discovery, you know, we've had, uh, you know, Sukkoth, a, a major copper discovery as a follow up, and there will be more. So the, or you look at Cambalda, found in 1966, people continuing to find new deposits in that region. So that's that the embedded option value, that massive power of making that initial discovery, then underpins economic value creation for a generation or two. Yeah, great. Thanks, John. And, and it's, you know, from our perspective at Geoscience Australia, just seeing those discoveries happen is really exciting and it gets us really enthused about, you know, doing more science and, and looking at new ways we can actually, you know, support the process. So, so thank you. Uh, Andrew, if I could turn to you, um, as the CEO of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority with a mandate to use science in supporting policy development and the regulatory activities you have for the basin, I'm wondering if you could tell us something about the key challenges facing the water sector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've only got a few minutes. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and what role science, particularly geoscience, can help play in addressing those challenges? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, look, incredibly important. I mean, we actually have a statutory requirement to use the best available science, and and that's a very big part of of what we do. So, um, you know, making sure that we have access to pre-competitive information uh, is incredibly important. And 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 cross government, it's not just what we do in the MDBA. In many ways, we're a contracting agent. So, um, you know, understanding what's there is is is, is crucial. I think. Um, you know, groundwater's perhaps been the poor cousin of overland flows as far as the Murray Darling Basin is concerned, right back through its 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 um you know history of sort of development since really 19, 1903, 1904, when when the focus was on navigation. And I think you know the the millennium drought certainly brought the focus much more to the 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 needs of, of groundwater as well as as Carol sort of highlighted talking about Will Kenya. You know, if you look at it, uh there was a cap put on diversions of, of surface water uh in the Murray-Darling Basin in the 1990s as a, as a first step to sort of better resource management. Groundwater um, was really only done with the water resource planning process in 2019, so some you know two, two and a bit decades um, later. So I think it's fair to say that the complexity and importance of groundwater um, hasn't been well understood, uh, and yet in dry years, it can be up to 20% of, of, of the use of water in the basin. Most years it averages about 10. Last year it was 7.4 because it was very wet. Um, but we are going into a drying period. And, and so we'll see the importance of, of, of groundwater uh, increase, and particularly for, for regional communities, communities like Walgut and Brewarra and Burke and Wilcania. That sort of northern half of the basin is where there is a real strong dependence on, on groundwater. Um, in a couple of years' time, we have to do the first statutory review of of the basin plan, uh, and groundwater, I think, is going to play a much more central role in that in, than perhaps it has done in the past with assessments of of the needs of 
of the basin and and you know, fair to say we're getting a better understanding but we still have some way to go and so we have a statutory evaluation in 25 a review in 26 and and you know understanding our groundwater resources trying to take stock of those identifying where there's gaps in knowledge that will be a really important focus in each of the themes that we're looking at so a regulatory design how do we manage groundwater first nations how do we use their knowledge sustainable water limits i think um you know that does form part of our management of the basin the um uh, groundwater is part of 29 of the 33 water resource plans in the basin, albeit that probably 12 of those represent three quarters of the use. But you know, how does that play in and how does that interact with surface water, I think, is something we need to understand a lot better. And as we start to look at well, what are our other options available to us, whether it be aqua, aqua for reef, recharge, those sorts of things, again, that, that pre-competitive data, the geoscience is just going to be so um, incredibly important and so working with the likes of GA and we're doing some work with with CSIRO uh, at the present point in time around sort of our knowledge of groundwater um, and where sort of managed conjunctively with surface water we can deliver better outcomes so it's it's absolutely central to what we do and I think as we look forward it's going to be more so let alone to say when we start to look at things like hydrogen development, which will occur in many parts of the basin, potentially, um, you know, that's going to be a big user of the resource. So how do we manage these different resource demands within the overall management framework of the water for the basin? Because whatever happens, it's still got to fit within the environmentally sustainable level of take. So understanding that interface is it's it's absolutely central to what we do. And we're probably not as far ahead as we probably should be at this juncture, if I'm really honest. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I mean, that, those are really, really in, insightful comments. And um, I agree with you that uh, it seems to me that groundwater is, is, you know, as you put it, probably been the poor cousin up until now, yeah. but yeah. clearly into the future is going to have to play a more important role. Um, and, and I think you're right. There's a, there's a, what, what I'm sensing from what you're saying is there's a massive opportunity yeah, the there, there is, Andrew, and I think it's 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 about quality and quantity. I mean, you know, a lot of the a lot of the communities that that really rely on groundwater um, have had to deal with quality issues as well. I mean, while which probably the most recent and pertinent example of that, um, but you know, managing that and understanding you know, different strata, you get different quality of water. So how does that play into uh, what a what a town's water management strategy is? Um, I think it's also going to dictate changes in agronomic practices as well. So, um, you know, we need to understand more. I think we also need to understand more about flows and return flows. I mean, we don't yet know enough of how water moves through the basin and, and where it returns and how it's recharged and, and, and what sort of, again, management practices allow us to enhance that. You know, in some instances, there's a weird or almost a perverse outcome that by um, – changing the use of water for environmental outcomes, you actually reduce uh, some of the runoff back into the aquifers because you're not pushing it out through agricultural practices. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but you know we've got to understand those sorts of implications as we work out how do we use groundwater and ground and how do we get better quality groundwater as we go forward. Yeah, uh, that's a great comment. and and you know it, it goes to the whole point of you know understanding the earth system. Yeah, uh, in, a, in a holistic sense, which is yeah. something that I guess geologists are, are quite good at. And yes, so, indeed. Um, so Economists not can, so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so something we can bring to the to the table. Very good, thank you, uh, Glenn. Maybe I could just uh, move to you for the sort of next item. Um, yeah, you know, you've spoken publicly about how uh, data is presented at the showcase last year informed some of NTEX's decision making to develop hydrogen opportunities. I'm wondering, you know, based upon your experience with dealing with the data we provide and uh, what you would say to other industry people who might be listening or, you know, tuning in later, who may be out there looking to make their first move uh, and how to use the pre-competitive data and information that we provide to help them. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's a really good question. And, and thanks for having me uh, on board this afternoon. Look, um, we were very fortunate about 12 months ago to sort of tune in to the um, Exploring the Future showcase. And we'd been working in hydrogen a lot and quickly realised the storage of hydrogen as a gas is a, a really, really tricky proposition, particularly if you're looking at gigawatt scale developments uh, here in Australia. Uh, fortuitously, the work that was being undertaken by Geoscience Australia was part of the program with, you know, likes of Andrew Feitz and Maria Bradshaw and their teams. Really... 
uh, put a magnifying glass on a particular basin being the Polder Basin in South Australia. Now, it's a very, very little basin. Most people have never heard of it as a small intratonic basin. Uh, and to be honest, another a lot of renowned geologists that I'd mentioned in South Australia about this little basin, and they kind of uh, look quite puzzled to me. So I guess credit to Geoscience Australia for really um, putting a spotlight on this basin. It was effectively a, a, a former basin that had been explored for oil and gas, and it was found to contain, uh, you know, no uh, oil and gas charge or, or source. So, um, but you know, there's a lot of good data sitting out there from the early 1980s, which really. Uh, you know, Geoscience Australia brought to light um, in relation to particularly large salt deposits, which uh, the Polder Basin is known for. And for the benefit of the listeners, having large salt uh, allows you to develop, uh, in, in you know, when I say large salt, large thicknesses of salt uh, up to sort of a kilometre thickness, allows you to engineer underground salt caverns, uh, which then can be used for the storage of energy, uh, particularly hydrogen. Uh, you know, and you know, having the availability, I guess, really lowered the barrier to entry for for smaller explorer development companies such as Entex uh, to get into the market. So, uh, re really, really grateful. And the only thing I would add to you know, what else can companies do? I says, you know, understanding in the information coming out from Geoscience Australia, uh, particularly the showcase, the uh, the papers that were, were released today. Um, uh, make sure you cross them, but also reach out to Geoscience Australia. We've been very fortunate with the team at GA uh, to follow up, um, to really de-risk um, uh, or, or give us a little bit more confidence in some of the geological work that was undertaken. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. And, and maybe to build on what you're saying, um, we're always very happy to talk to, to companies about their, their, their plans. Everything that's said is obviously confidential, uh, and, but, you know, our great team of scientists here love to talk about science love to showcase the latest thinking and the latest information. So it's always very really good to have that engagement with, with companies and you know, find out what they're thinking and what, what their um, strategies might be because it helps us and it obviously helps the companies and that, that dialogue can be extremely important. So I mean, I would encourage the other companies to follow Glenn's uh, um, uh, example and you know, come and talk to us and, and talk about what we're doing and, and share, share ideas because it's, it's, it's really important. Uh, John, maybe I could just put uh, on a similar line of questioning for you, because I know you've been involved in encounters take up of tenements in the Tenant Creek to Mount Isa area, which I showed in my presentation. It's been a, you know, a, yeah. a new area potentially of uh, uncovering new uh, province, mineral province. Um, what would what would you add to Glenn's comments from maybe from a, from a minerals perspective about, I mean, how you would engage with geoscience information in the pre-competitive uh, data well, and information that we provide? Well, for us. It, it, you know, it's it's absolutely uh, you know the, the the first stage where we can you know look at look at an area and and you know develop or or, or motivate an idea as to why it might be prospective. So uh, we're probably one of a number of companies in Encounter, but but I think this is something we've tried to do uh, pretty well is be very sensitive, very tied into the latest data that emerges. And, and you know, we have our own frameworks, our own ideas, but that, that data then gels with that. And if we see opportunities, we peg first and ask questions later because, uh, you know, we, we, we know that the rewards go to the people who get into the search space first, right? For, it's, it's all about first mover. And, uh, you know, we, we, we put a lot of work, even though we're a small junior company, into interfacing with the science that comes out of Geoscience Australia, trying to engage at a, at a relatively high technical level. We, we think we can do that and therefore understand those implications. And, you know, a, as soon as it looks like it makes sense, uh, we, we'll jump on that. Now, we're a small company. We don't have the resources to explore all ourselves. But what we can do then is, is attract partners. And we've got a couple of great partners uh, in uh, BHP and South 32, who've then come in on on some of the ground that 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 we picked up, and, and, and maybe sort of then uh, package it a little bit more from an exploration uh, value value perspective, and then we brought these partners in. So yeah, we we uh, currently have had uh, an ongoing, even as we speak, deep drilling into some of these targets that are, were, were defined by a combination of uh, Geoscience Australia seismic and uh, and geophysical data, gravity and so on. And uh, look, we're, we're seeing interesting things, you know, early days, but but we're seeing, you know, re really interesting things. And, and 
I think that's the way you do it. Uh, and you know, I don't think we're I don't think we're alone. I think other companies have been taken advantage of it as well. But uh, but I do think there's more. To be honest, more that, that the Australian uh, mining and exploration sector but can do to to be alert to when this new information comes. Not that I'm trying to encourage competitors to encounter, but I do think sometimes that uh, you know some of the stuff sits there and it takes a little while before before people realise, wow, that's pretty interesting. That's opening up a a, a new area. So uh, you know, I think people do well to to pay close attention to these new data releases. Yeah, thanks, John. And and I would add that you know that those data releases are from us at least anyway are coming out pretty regularly, mm. um, you know, almost on a weekly basis for a program the size of Exploring for the Future. And I and I and I like the way you both you and Glenn both talked about sort of getting in on the ground early um, mm. by getting access to the information and just and just making you know a decision to go in if if you need to. And I guess that's sort of what differentiates a little bit the mineral sector from perhaps the energy sector. Whereby you know the, the first movers are normally quite small and agile and able to get in there, um, whereas in the energy sector because you need slightly deeper pockets perhaps to, yeah. to develop a resource, um, it's normally the bigger companies. And and what we've found working with them is that they tend to take all the data, hoover it up, and then make their own decisions. But that's great. That's okay as well because because they've got the resources to do that. It's not. I it mean, what what I'm what I'm sensing is the pre-competitive information doesn't discriminate. It, it's for both. And, and I think that's part of the power of what we do. Well, yeah. well yes, Andrew, if I can just elaborate, I, I think that's a good point. You, you know, we have a very entrepreneurial uh, junior sector, not necessarily always well-resourced in terms of capital, but because we have pre-competitive geoscience, we have that entrepreneurial sector can actually do early stage greenfield stuff. If, if we didn't have it, we couldn't. You know that, yeah. so we would lose the input of that, all that entrepreneurial energy into exploration if we didn't have pre, at least greenfields, if we didn't have pre-competitive geoscience. So that's a very important point. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. If I might, I mean, yeah. just yeah, adding there, I think it's very much the same from a, a sort of a water and, and, and agricultural development standpoint. I mean, if we are going to see as a consequence of climate change, agronomic sort of practices change across the basin. That that's a given. But I think the earlier we can start to identify, you know, water resources, uh, particularly groundwater, you know, farming communities can actually make investment decisions because we're going to see you know, potentially the need for greater surface water recovery. And so, you know, groundwater starts to play a real key role there. And so, again, the early and, 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 and accurate identification of groundwater resources can actually start to drive some agronomic investment decisions, which is going to be super important for communities that are very, very dependent on you know, irrigated agriculture for their existence. So, so, same sort of thing as John said, but with a with a different lens. But that early stage information guiding early investment decisions, uh, and again, not just for the very large agribusinesses, but for sort of some of the smaller family farm operations, that's super important. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Andrew. It's good to have that perspective. Um, I wanted to come to this a bit later, but but maybe, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that there's obviously an opportunity for us to look for better uses of allocated water, but also from our perspective, maps looking at for those where there's unallocated water and what, what you might better do with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Anthea, I, I might start with you on, uh, with this one, but I'm keen to get thoughts from everyone on this particular topic. Um, but Anthea, I, I wondered if you, considering the potential to use data and information to inform decision-making, uh, what opportunities do you see for greater cross-government collaboration and coordination and bringing the science together to inform those decisions. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so uh, I think there's huge potential uh, from collaboration and coordination. Um, and I was actually very impressed by the the range of organisations that Carol um, put up on the screen earlier in terms of um, uh, organisations that you're working together with. Um, but I guess I would say, um, so pre-competitive geoscience data, it's not just about the mineral potential of the land. Um, and I mean, Andrew's just was talking about this. I mean, it, it brings together a range of other really important data to inform both commercial and government policy decisions. So that includes, as we've been talking about, groundwater, um, but also, for example, locations for finding and storing hydrogen, CCUS, um, other forms of renewable energy. Um, and so while each kind of data set can be useful, combining this information into one source makes it a lot more powerful. 
And so, for example, new mines will need to have information about the opportunities for renewables. They may also want to know about the availability of groundwater. And from a government perspective, um, this information can also support regulatory decisions and assessment of environmental impacts. So I guess at the Commonwealth level, um, you know, there's a lot of potential for uh, the, the various agencies and departments to be working together on this data and, and already we are in terms of, um, you know, the Department of Industry uh, working also with the Department of Climate Change, Energy and Water and with CSIRO. Um, but I also think there's a lot of potential uh, for um, government to collaborate with state and territory um, as well. And we know that GA works closely with the different state and territory geological survey bodies. Um, and this, I think, really helps to align um, activities across levels of government um, and get the most out of um, your programs of work. But I think um, one area of collaboration that I think is really important um, for thinking about is, is around thinking about um, and improving the applications for um, and the ways that people are using geoscience. And so in that, I mean collaborating with users. Um, understanding their needs and how they use the information, um, you know, uh, this is going to be really important. Um, and a good example would be working with First Nations people um, and also communities more broadly. Yeah, great. And that, that's fantastic. And that's certainly been a thread that we've we've brought to the program, even in just the last few years, has tried to, as we've alluded to in our presentations, and you'll see more, and the people will see more about that over the next couple of days, is, Really, how we bring the other people along, and, and understanding what the organisation, uh, what the um, uh, data and information are telling them, uh, and it was really interesting. I I had the good fortune to talk to some of our New Zealand counterparts uh, at GNS Science, and the way that they engage with First Nations people in New Zealand, and that the approach they take is they they go there and they just talk about, well, we've come to talk to you because we think there's something interesting here. And let's go on a journey together to find out what that what that's about. And I think that's a that was a really inspired way of perhaps approaching um, the engagement, and uh, and it's got them a lot of traction, a lot of um, a lot of good benefits that have come out of that. So thank you. Uh, look, I'll throw to you, Andrew. You know, uh, from your your time at APO and out the MDBA, sort of in the crossing, the industry government divide. Um, mm -hmm. Do, do you, what do you see as uh, the benefits of really around government collaboration and coordination in, in, in the sense of yeah, science yeah, look, it's, to inform decisions? It, it, it's, it's hugely important because there's no one agency of government that can do everything. And, and um, you know, it's the old, old sort of story of marginal efficiency. Where can you be most marginally efficient? Um, and so the importance of collaboration is 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 central to everything that we do. You know, we collaborate very closely with a number of government agencies and, you know, at 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 the MDBA, it's very much into the states as well because actually water is a state responsibility. So, you know, when we when we talk about sort of running the Murray River or, or or looking at flood information, you know, flow rates, release rates, river heights, all that gauging data, that's actually state data, but it informs the decisions we make, and 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 that's the case with groundwater or or surface water. Um, you know. I think the other point is, and, and this is why it's important for government to be able to sort of in many cases lead this collaboration, it's actually really expensive um, and, and it requires a significant investment. An example in, in my space now is, you know, we're spending almost $70 million, $66 million uh, to get river models to actually talk to each other. Uh, and when I say river models, I'm talking groundwater as well. There are 24 different models across the basin and believe it or not they don't actually talk to each other and so we've got to spend 70 million dollars to actually get to a point where those models can talk to each other and we can have sort of then a front-end data portal that people can actually access that data to make um, decisions and, and, and to get that sort of whole of basin view and I think you know that's what we're often missing and, and governments are always very well intentioned they go off and pursue what's the most important thing at the time but there are very few agencies and if i now put my private ex-private sector hat on governments aren't good at stepping back and taking a whole of government view and i think it's very important for agencies to be able to like like ga like the mdba to perhaps push government to take that whole of whole of government view because otherwise we can generate um you know significant inefficiencies and and i think you know, that's something that then the private sector in turn has to work with governments to actually in some in some cases actually the private sector has a better whole of government view because they're not in the weeds doing the work and I, and I think that's where there's a real opportunity for for greater um collaboration between 
the public and the private. And then I think the, the last point is around just the accessibility of information. I think one of the things I've found coming into government is that we're not very good at in, in some, and, and GA is actually, I would say, one of the great exceptions to this. You're very, very good at sharing your data externally. We're not very good at, at sort of letting that data get out there. And a lot of the data that built the first basin plan was only made available in the last three or four years. And we're very committed to changing that as we go forward. But how do you create those front end portals to allow other people to use your data, to make investment decisions, to undertake modeling and the like? I think there's a real opportunity for us to get better in that space. And that again, requires cross government collaboration in order to be effective. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And that's certainly a message that we've been well, at this organisation and others have been hearing is, you know, how do we actually bring together perhaps for a common, you know, online platform? There's a, a there's a, a thing that's been released recently called a Digital Atlas of Australia, where we bring yeah. all the spatial data together to, you know, inform those decision making. But your, your mm. point's well made and we're certainly listening and, and, and trying to do better in that space. And I'm glad to hear that GS, you think GA is yeah, very, very there, much. good very at that. Much. Yeah. Um, Perhaps, Glenn, I'll go to you next from an industry perspective. Um, uh, what would you see as the benefits of, of government collaboration coordination in terms of science? Yeah, we look, we, uh, you know, I guess first and foremost, as an industry um, player, we do understand the complexities of, uh, you know, making things happen. I think sometimes it's easy to sit back as an industry player and assume that legislation can change tomorrow and in the case of when we look at things such as you know hydrogen storage in, in salt cabins um, we're fortunate in South Australia and that there's a legislative and regulatory framework already in place to support the storage of hydrogen in, in the subsurface whether that's in salt cabins or depleted reservoirs or aquifers um, uh, but, but there are other jurisdictions and we do look at some of the great work coming out from Geoscience Australia and probably touching on John's point a little bit about, you know, getting tenure is really, really important. And so if a piece of information comes out, but I can't secure tenure over a particular resource that's been identified, uh, there's not a lot of time or, you know, we, we don't have a lot of funds where we can sort of sit by the phone waiting for that legislation to change until such time we can get in. Or maybe that as the time prevails, uh, more uh, competitors jump in and it becomes quite a competitive process to uh, to jump in for that tenure. And uh, being a smaller developer, a scale up company, we don't always have the financial wherewithal to, uh, you know, compete against them the larger larger players but um but we acknowledge the importance of smaller explorers here in australia and particularly the role they have to play in developing resources up very quickly and, and in an agile way um and to a point where maybe a, a larger major comes in uh to develop that resource so uh um, but but importantly uh, we know that the the commonwealth too work closely with the states uh which is important um but uh, I guess, uh, you know, if there's any opportunity uh, for industry to play, I think it's uh, how we can support and, and inform, um, you know, our legislation and uh, policy makers on, on what are the missing gaps. Yeah, right. Thanks, Glenn. Um, uh, John, did you have any uh, comments around in that this one as well? Yeah, yeah Andrew, the, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, firstly, to sort of uh, build on what Glenn said, the relationship between an understanding of, of geoscience and policy making, uh, I, I think that's going to be very relevant in some of these new areas like gold hydrogen, nat natural hydrogen. And, and I would be disappointed if uh, that became something that was totally locked in the, the kind of high barrier to entry petroleum exploration space and you know, entrepreneurial geologists who are thinking about, because we don't really understand it very well. So we want to tap into as much innovation and new ideas as possible. And of course, there has to be the, like Glenn said, the ability to protect your idea. So I would like to see a conversation uh, between you guys who know the science and the policy makers a bit more on that and how that could be facilitated. Second point is, I think there's a real opportunity uh, and you talked about partnering with First Nations uh, earlier, but I think there's a real opportunity to, to turn that conversation around a bit. And we've had examples in Western Australia where First Nations communities have come to the Geological Survey of Western Australia and said, look, we want some economic development in our ground, in our land, help us. So go and collect a, a, a survey, a geochemical survey or whatever. So I think there's there's those sort of partnering opportunities that are, are a little bit more empowered than, than perhaps the ones that we've talked about in the past. And, and I personally would like to see Geoscience Australia take a lead in, in, in trying to identify those sort of opportunities, obviously linking with, with the other 
uh, you know, relevant uh, agencies. Thanks, John. Yeah, and we have had representations and we've gone from First Nations communities wanting to, you know, develop resources, whether they be water, you know, mineral energy, whatever, on their on their land. Um, and we are in the process of signing some agreements and having long-term relationships. And I, I guess that's the that's the benefit of having that long-term strategic view of the engagement and being able to have the time and the and the space to be able to develop those longer-term relationships where these sort of things start coming to light. Um, because it's, it moves from a sort of transaction to more of a relationship um, basis, which is which is or a partnership basis. Very good. Um, I'm, I'm just notice. I'm just conscious of time, and there's a couple of questions I want to get to. Um, so perhaps uh, I'll just stay with you, John, for a second. Um, I just wanted to know what you see as Australia's competitive advantage over other countries in terms of providing pre-competitive data and information to support our uh, resources sectors. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Andrew. I, I actually think there's one really key thing at, at the centre of this competitive advantage, and I've already touched on it a few times, but I think it's the relationship between, you know, a large government agency, uh, you know, doing things in a sort of strategic uh, national interest type perspective with a very entrepreneurial mining industry that that that's uh, you know the free market in 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 in, in all its kind of uh, in intensity you just have to go to somewhere like diggers and dealers last week in Kalgoorlie to see that and some people would often see these things as you know from a socio-economic point of view quite different but in Australia they're not we're integrated one of the reasons we're integrated is Geoscience Australia, and I've been working with you guys for 30 years, you are such a customer focused or organisation. And we don't often say that about government organisations, but you guys have been great uh, and for, for, for decades now. And I think that's critical because we can talk to you, you listen to us, we listen to you, but, uh, but I think it's a partnership. And I would put that at the centre of our uh, global competitive advantage in this space, Andrew. Thank you, John. And, and I guess something we, we sort of pride ourselves on as also as the, I think you might have alluded to it, is sort of the bringing the science value add to those data sets. The national data sets, the, the you know, the consistent collection is all very, very good. Other countries um, uh, emulate that or yeah. are trying to. I think one of the competitive advantages we have really is about the science knowledge that we bring uh, to yeah, integrate yeah, yeah, and bring yeah. those together. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me uh, uh, elaborate on it because data is nothing without us a narrative without a story to to help you yeah. understand it and you know we need that as as uh, explorers but we also need that for our investors so and you know some great examples like carol's work on uh, the controls of lithospheric architecture and 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 you know some of these new patterns in these exciting new data sets that that that's a really critical part of it and and i might comment that if we look at uh funding in the Australian system for integrative research. Unfortunately, it, it, it's not always there. You know, we, our, our funding system for research often funds deep silos, ex expertise in deep silos, not so much the sort of synthesis, and yet that synthesis is so critical to our business. So really, Geoscience Australia is probably one of those few organisations in our space where we've got people who are really motivated to do this synthesis, uh, build these mineral system stories, build these important narratives. So yeah, 100%, I totally agree with that. Thank you. Uh, um, Glenn, uh, just from your perspective, I know, I know you've been you know, traveling around the world and uh, looking at uh, various hydrogen projects around the world. And, and I'd just be interested in your thoughts on how what we do in Australia compares for what you've seen in other countries. Yeah, well, we're really, really lucky here in Australia. Um, and the, the main reason for that is that, one, we have some fantastic information coming out um, by not only just Australia, but our states. But also, two, we have a really good legislative and, and regulatory framework that allows um, that information to come out, the formulation of ideas, some IP, and then the capture or security of that IP uh, via a tenure system. And when I've looked around other locations in the world, particularly in relation to salt cavern storage, across Europe. Uh, yes, there's lots of information out there. Um, how do I get access or tenure to uh, a salt dome in, in Germany? Well, you, you can't really because really the state government utilities have taken those up. 
and and so in similar parts of the US um, where we've started to look at. So so realistically, the information might be there, but it comes purely like an academic exercise because there's nothing really to skew of the IP uh, that goes with it, um, that information coming out. So I think we're in a very, very fortunate position in Australia. And I think that's really, really important for our global competitiveness because it allows that innovation that John's touched on to uh, get some data, turn it into that story, and uh, and a secure an investment um, with having that underlying tenure. 